Hello, and welcome to another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Dokomomo Hawaii Show. Uh, today's episode is going to be looking at Edwin Bauer. This is our fourth installment of that, and today I'm your host, uh, Graham Hart. Um, so we've looked at Bauer over a couple of different episodes previously. First, about his body of work here in Hawaii. He was a proliferant mid-century architect. And then we looked at uh, his life and um, all the different twists and turns that took in, in our last episode with a couple of other guests. Uh, but today's guest is Brandon Large. And um, the two of us are going to be looking at Bauer's work in kind of a bit more of, uh, of an analysis about the principles of what, what makes these projects really good and really well suited for Hawaii. So I'd like to thank Brandon Large for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always able to uh, pull you out of work and, and, and do this for me. So thank you. <laughs> So, um, as I was talking about, uh, we're going to look at Bauer's projects um, in a bit more specificity, and we're going to be looking at some of the ones that he's most remembered for, and then a, use a few examples of ones that he's been a bit forgotten about, you know, some of his forgotten projects. So, for start us off with, this uh, building here in the background is um, at the former uh, Kaiser Hawaiian Village. It was Kaiser's Ale Ale Lanai, Lanai's, built in 1955 by Kaiser, and, or by Bauer and a couple others. Um, but uh, what we want to talk about is maybe starting with the next slide, is these projects uh, that Bauer is still remembered for because these are still around. It's the Breakers Hotel and the uh, Hawaiiana Hotel, built in 54 and 55. And so what about them makes them so good? What do you see here, Brandon? <laughs> Well, well, I think they give a really good sense of Hawaii. Um, there's, it's a very lush, tropical uh, kind of courtyard condition. Um, the image with the lady sitting inside, she, she has the doors open. She's experiencing uh, the garden space outside. It's very, very tropical and um, seems really suitable for Hawaii. Yeah, I think both of these projects were you know, hotels that were built in this period and really helped paint the picture to the rest of the world and really sell the idea of what Hawaii was. Um, and sure, there's a lot of, you know, motifs and a lot of kind of different um, things about them that, you know, kind of a little bit more kitsch today. But Bauer kind of started here and then evolved his projects um, into kind of creating something that works more universally. So I think if we go to the next slide, this is the Oahuan and the Oahuan Tower, 56 and 58. And actually, Brandon lives here. So let him kind of introduce these projects. Yeah, so uh, here Bauer had kind of taken his, um, his hotel idea and expanded it to a multifamily dwelling. So um, on, the, on the left side, you see the low-rise uh, Oahuan um, Limited, and it's pretty much the same configuration as the Hawaiiana. Um, and then on the right side, you see the Oahuan Tower, uh, which... Um, it's kind of a, an evolution of um, some of the ideas he was working on, but also made for uh, a really efficient building because obviously you have a smaller footprint. So, Yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, as he kind of developed this unit model, which we'll talk about further, he starts kind of scaling it up, uh, up and up, and kind of um, making it work for more projects. So actually, if we go to the next building, uh, this is the CLIA, and, and I... Uh, Get to call this place home. Um, so this was, as you can kind of see, it's basically the Oahuan Tower, but there's three of them now, and they're kind of in this um, village of, of high-rises, right? So he's taken this kind of village garden idea that he had with some of the smaller-scale projects and um, taking it to these high-rise things. So he's you know, continuing to evolve the idea of, of um, this Hawaiian urban living yeah, you kind of get the best of work, both worlds. You get high density, but also you get the benefit of um, having lush gardens surrounding your building um, and interacting with them on the way, on the way to your unit. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out, I love this photo of the Kalia um, with Diamond Head in the background. That's one of the tallest buildings in the area. This is probably like early 60s, late 50s. And now it's the shortest building in the area. But it still is a great place to live. So actually, and then if we go to the next slide, Speaking of places to live, this was Bauer's um, apartment building. Uh, he lived in it, and it, the building, or rather the picture in the top left, is how it was when it first opened up. Um, so this is 2170 Kohio Avenue, built in 1959. 
and the top penthouse level was was Bowers um, for him and his family. And um, we went back and, and looked at how this building looks now and realized that this was actually a part of two identical buildings that are built right next door to each other. And they've been, you know, this is one of his projects that I think have been forgotten about. You know, these buildings have both been renovated in different, you know, ways. Um, one of them, the one that his, you know, apartment building was at, or apartment unit was actually in, looked like it got updated um, in the, you know, 70s or 80s or something like that with this you know, this new glass and uh, green mullions and just kind of really taking a lot of the character out of it, out of the original intent of the building. And then the other one um, has some of the original breeze block, some of the, you know, the original detailing and the way that the paint is um, still applied to it. But then all the lanai's have been enclosed. So I think this is an example of, you know, luckily the buildings that uh, Brandon and I both live in still have, you know, the original intent for the most part. Um, but a lot of his work has been forgotten, and they started off with such great principles um, that made them well suited to Hawaii. So I think we want to kind of spend the rest of the episode looking at what we think these guiding principles were. Let's go to the first slide. So the first thing that we pulled away from Bauer's work is actually this term that um, mid-century Hawaii architect uh, Harry Seckel Point, which is environmental living. And this is this idea of, you know, living with the climate, living with the environment, you know, indoor, outdoor living. It's something that really can be afforded here in Hawaii um, more than anywhere else in the world almost. Uh, and, and it's unique to this place. Yeah, and, uh, and making sure that, you know, whatever elements are used in the building are adapting appropriately to the climate. Um, yeah. It's essentially a way to live outside without having to live outside. That's kind of how I'd imagine it. Right, definitely. And, you know, just these three pictures of kind of indoor spaces, but they seem so outdoor, right? So it's, it's embracing the outdoor qualities inside. Okay, so environmental living in, in, a, um, in a quick recap. Okay, the next slide is the next principle and and the couple of projects that we've talked about follow this principle as well and it's this idea of an urban oasis right a lot of these projects either were designed in an urban environment or soon became a quite densely populated populated urban environment and so he was careful to uh, cite the buildings in a way that left space for an oasis for a garden for an amenity for a pool or courtyard or whatever it was um, yeah, so here's the Clea Hotel, which is now just the Clea building, the Hawaiiana, the Breakers, and the White Sands, all with these kind of introspective courtyards. And um, yeah, so then the next principle is uh, this idea of democratic design. And this was actually a term that we're kind of borrowing from Charles and Ray Eames, and their thought was, you know, how do you design something that's easily accessible to everyone? You know, make it affordable. How do you, you know, add quality to people's lives for everyday occasions? Um, of course, now all of their work is, or all of their designs are, are, are very expensive. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was about mass production and, you know, utilizing uh, technologies of the day to kind of make things more affordable. This is an old advertisement for uh, the development of the Kalia and showing the Oahuan and Oahuan Tower and the Makiki Inn and um, you know the prices that they were, they were trying to sell these for and trying to appeal to everyone. And they wasn't, these weren't luxury exactly. buildings. Yeah. yeah, I mean essentially using the same approach that uh, Charles and Ray Eames did, right? Democratic design saying, okay, Let's design something that everybody can enjoy, and let's design something that everybody can afford. Um, and I think, I think it's a really smart approach. Yeah, definitely. OK, and the next principle is uh, human scale. Now, so this one, what we mean by human scale is that you can design a building um, as you know, a, a massive sculpture, uh, you know, a huge high rise or something like that, that you know, is maybe beautiful to look at from far away, but you can't really picture yourself there. You know, it's kind of hard to, to see it because it's the mass of it, the scale of it so large that um, it doesn't have a lot of human quality, right? It's very mono monolithic or monumental. Bowers buildings, even though some of them are quite large, they have this kind of 
tectonics to it that make it smaller scale, make it feel comfortable, make it feel hu human, really. Um, so here's a picture of the breakers, but here's, you know, you can see a couple of people in that photo and just kind of relate to them, you know, standing up on the lanai, being out on the pool. You know, these are kind of places you'd want to be. It's very homey, it's very human. Exactly, yeah. and you can, you can understand exactly how big the building is, even from a distance, because that, the elements, um, the elements are pretty clear as to, to what they are and how, you know, how they relate to the human scale. As opposed to, like you mentioned, some towers that have gone up where they'll stack three levels together, and from a distance you have no idea how tall that is except for relative to maybe another building nearby that has um, some semblance of human scale to it. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, and then the next principle, the next slide here, is kind of going off of that, but um, it's the aesthetic quality that these buildings have. So yes, they were designed economically, and yes, they were designed, um, you know, very functionally. But there's also a nice sculptural quality to them. You know, just for an example, this stairwell on the outside of, of this building was the, the railing is left open versus, you know, on the, the breezeway outside, it's solid, you know. And so there's this play of kind of light and shadow and, you know, tilting things slightly to kind of give it a little bit more interest. And the Continental Building up in the corner there, you know, that could have been, it's an office building, could have been designed as just a plain box. But really it's this composition of volumes and spaces, um, which gives it a lot more interest mm -hmm. than it really needed to have in order to get the, the kind of the function done. So um, now that we've kind of introduced these principles, you know, how do they work is what we kind of want to dive really into for the rest of the episode. Um, so I think, I think we'll just jump right into how it works in the next slide here. Uh, the first thing is just the layout of the building. You know, a building's got to function, it's got to work. And a lot of these buildings that we're talking about are either multifamily or hotel. So they have, you know, living units, and then they have circulation. And that's the basic programming of each level. And from the get-go, um, Bauer's successful projects have what we call a single-loaded corridor, meaning that the corridor um, serves units only from one side rather than um, having units on both sides of it. And so what this does is that it gives the, the unit itself um, an exterior wall on two sides, meaning that you can have light and air come in through it um, where if you have a double loaded camp, it's just, you know, you can maybe get some light in on one side, but then the other can, you know, side doesn't have that same condition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Basically, yeah. yeah right? I mean, you summed it up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of the buildings now, of course, um, a lot of developers want this high efficiency. So they think, you know, let's double load it. Well, you all of a sudden you lose the potential to get cross ventilation. Um, so then you're required to condition your space. Um, which ends up costing a lot more money for the developer, but also doesn't make for um, a very immersive uh, space. You don't, you don't know where you are. You could really be anywhere in the world. So um, I think we're both big proponents of the single loaded corridor. Yeah, definitely. I in mean, Hawaii. In, yeah, in Hawaii, right, this exterior corridor, we call them breezeways, right? I mean, it's, it's something that really um, can be done so successfully in Hawaii. So it's, it's you know, should be kind of thought of at the, at the get-go of when designing these kind of types of projects. So let's go to the next slide. So now that we're kind of breaking it down into the, the unit itself, how do you see these principles working? Um, so the first one, environmental living, you know, by having that single loaded corridor, you can pull the air and the natural ventilation right through the building. Um, and, you know, by having louvers on one side and sliding doors on the back side, you get this great Venturi effect. And, um, you know, I live on an eighth floor open air apartment building, right? Mm -hmm. you know, or open air, you know, home. Um, and you get this privacy that you only really get on the eighth floor that you wouldn't get maybe sometimes on, on a single family home even. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think going with the environmental living, um, you can kind of notice the overhangs on both sides. So you have, you have kind of these outdoor spaces, you have the overhang. Um, which of course is keeping the sun off of your glazing, which is another uh, big thing that people should be considering um, when designing buildings in Hawaii is keep the sun off the glazing 
because mm -hmm. then it keeps your interior space a lot cooler, especially if you are cross ventilating it. Yeah, and so actually, uh, Bauer deals with this kind of solar shading in different ways. Here at the Clea and some of his other kind of more high rise, you know, he uses these overhangs um, to kind of help shield things and provide these open spaces. But sometimes the buildings are, you know, laid out in such a way that there yeah. is no overhang. So like the Oahuan does it slightly differently, right? Yeah, so the Oahuan has no overhang. Um, so how Bauer treated that was uh, instead of having glass, he just put floor to ceiling redwood jealousies. Um, so you can close them when the sun's beaming onto your unit and keeps the sun out yeah, pretty most nice, of you know, yeah, most and, of the time. But then still lets the air come through. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's how environmental living works at the unit scale. Um, for the next principle, this urban oasis thing. So we talked about kind of at this larger scale how Bauer leaves space on the site for gardens and amenities and courtyards. Um, but how that affects your unit is actually kind of interesting as well. I mean, you're in these urban conditions, and a lot of times you're going to be either faced with looking at a building next door because there's not much room, or you can create um, a view because you don't have these views anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and not everybody can uh, afford a, a really nice view nowadays in Hawaii, especially. So uh, creating an interior views, interior gardens. Um, also spaces that people interact with as they're going to their building. So it's kind of this passive interaction with um, some version of um, the tropics, right? Even, yeah. even though it is, it is this kind of scripted, uh, choreographed, uh, tropical setting, um, it definitely evokes that. And I think we experience it in both of our buildings as well. Yeah, I mean, you can just see from the photo, um, you know, looking out from the interior outside, you know, this building doesn't have a view of the diamond head or the ocean. It has a view of palm trees, right? Which is, evokes to me just the same feeling of the, being in the tropics. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's really what it's about is, is, you know, because you're creating these great indoor-outdoor spaces, you want to have something nice to look at. Um, so then in the next principle, the um, democratic design principle. Well, so now what we mean by this is uh, you know, these buildings were built in a way that was most economically feasible. Um, it was built, you know, very functionally. But looking at even just the CMU, which is, you know, the concrete masonry units in the CLIA, um, you know, they're, they're a stack bond rather than a running bond. And the wall lengths are in the module of the CMU, meaning that you don't have to cut it. You know, you don't have a bunch of half blocks, which with saved, you know, a lot of, you know, time and labor and material when they were constructing these things. So there's a lot of thought to just how big the building is and how it's constructed. But then that construction, um, those methods wind up being the, f the finished material. So, mm -hmm. you know, doing them in a way that that's expressed and honest and pleasant to look at and economical, that's like, you know, three wins right there. Yeah, the win, win, win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even in even in my place, so we have uh, the single wall construction, uh, redwood jealousies, infilling infilling the unit. Um, and what was interesting about that, of course, it was kind of a very common building material at the time. Um, but even even the amount of detail paid to the finish of the material, um, so it was it was bleached in in the case of the Oahuan, um, which which helped to lighten up the space. Um, they didn't want to just throw these dark redwood panels up. They wanted to kind of treat them in a way that was going to feel um, a little more comfortable and domestic. Yeah, it um, looks very homey, right, with that, that material. So then in the next slide, um, there's this human scale thing. And, you know, it's kind of fascinating how Bauer designs the details of some of his buildings um, to have multiple function, right? So we talked about this area previously about the environmental living and letting all the light and the air through with these jealousies um, on the front, but also just standing in the breezeway, the way that it's designed with the, the, kind of the solid railing is that when people look up at the building, you have privacy. They don't see you walking along, you know, walking through the breezeway, um, there's a, you know, rather than having a glass rail, which they do a lot of times nowadays. Um, but then also when you're on the breezeway itself, one complaint about having single load of corridors is, oh, people can look into my unit. Well, Bowery's kind of figured out this way that if you're going to have, you know, ventilation and light coming in, it'll really block out um, 
uh, being able to see in at this high level, you know, because people are always going to be walking by. So people can't see into the units, but light and air can still come through. Yeah, exactly. And even the depth of the corridor, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he really understood what people could experience at, at, that, at that depth yeah. and um, just designed the entire building kind of to accommodate for that. And it's, it's also interesting because we've already talked about a few things that these, um, that these balconies and overhangs have done. So this is just another one of those things, right? I mean, um, it, provides an, it provides the kind of the sculptural quality of the building. Um, protection against the sun um, and the rain, allows the yeah. breeze in the mm -hmm. rain, um, but also uh, privacy. So it solves maybe three or four problems with with one design solution. Yeah, really. I mean, in just this detail. There's a lot going on, and you can kind of see, you know, as with a person standing there, how it works at these different levels. Um, we had kind of thought about before that even though. These buildings were built economically. You'd think that you might lose the human scale. You might lose a quality to the space. Rooms might get too tight, might get, you know, kind of unfriendly. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the size are, are really proportionate and really they feel right when you're in them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. So the rooms aren't too big. They're not too small. You don't, you don't ever want to be in a really, really big bedroom. It's just not comfortable. Um, there's, there's a certain kind of size that it would feel right, um, and he kind of nailed that. He didn't, he didn't scale it down because maybe it was a more affordable place. Um, he, he just kept it right at the sweet spot, and I think the same thing for the living space, kitchen, everything. It just works, it works really, really well. Um, and we, we live in the same size unit, and I, mm -hmm. and I think we both feel the same way. It's just super comfortable. Even at times, it feels maybe a little, a little bigger than it needs to be, but, but then you kind of sit right. back and you're like, oh, this is just perfect. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, and, and there's so much built in, um, you know, kind of storage and functionality to a lot of it that, you know, you, you don't need a lot of extra, you know, you don't need a basement that people put all their storage and, you know, random stuff in. It's just, it's just enough space to kind of fit everything that you need for living in, in the urban tropics. Um, yeah, so let's go to the next principle. So the aesthetic quality. Um, we talked about at the kind of the bigger scale of the, of the building, how it, you know, he spends a lot of time making these sculptural compositions. But then at this smaller scale, I think it's about the elements and the details that he brings in and how those kind of start to paint this picture of, of Hawaii. Um, so, yeah, there's many different examples. but Yeah, so he kind of has kind of this, like, a centralist attitude towards making the building itself. And then when it comes to the details um, or, or, you know, the... The types of doors or the textures that are that he's providing, um, they really kind of evoke this kind of tro Tropicana uh, feeling, right? So mm -hmm. you know he has the matchstick lines that you can see in the bottom left there, um, and also actually in the, the, the right side, um, but also just you know the the patterning in some of the breeze blocks or um, there's a number of different things. That... Yeah, I mean, so he's really kind of pulling from the vernacular. Um, language of the tropics and the Pacific, right? So he's using things like shoji doors and, you know, the matchsticks, like you said, and other kind of elements that, you know, evoke either Polynesia or Asia or just kind of Hawaiiana, right? You know, he's kind of pulling that, some of that from his hospitality experience, but he's bringing these into the multifamily, even some of his church and office projects to kind of continue, you know, reminding people that they're living, working, doing whatever in, in Hawaii. And you, you don't want to design a building that doesn't look like that. Yeah, but it provides good context. And I think especially when they were built, it's probably a very, very um, comforting thing for people to see. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So that brings us to our next slide, which we're going to spend some time on. Um, to kind of wrap up, you know, and, and, and summarize what, what we've been talking about. So. Bauer did, you know, over 30 projects that we know of. You know, we were kind of compiling a list, and I swear every month we find out that he did another project because, um, you know, something that gets uncovered. Um, but all of these buildings that he did have this kind of same level of, of thought to it. And, you know, we think use these same principles as originally intend intended. You know, and 50, 60 years on, you know, a lot of these buildings have been altered or remodeled or forgotten about. And... People use them differently, um, so they've they've kind of 
you know, have gone into a little bit of a, a disappearance or not as efficient as they originally intended to be. Um, but what we think these buildings kind of show and provide for us is a successful model to follow for future development. Yep. And, um, you know, there's other models that are, are, are were kind of brought into Hawaii that maybe aren't as, as appropriate. And those are the ones that people most of the time, you know, pick up on and, and develop here in Hawaii. And so we, we think that these buildings are so interesting, not only because they're great old buildings to look at, but because um, they work so well here. Yeah, and that's, that's a good note for sustainability. A lot of the developers are trying to, or, or being encouraged to make sustainable buildings, but, you know, they're kind of starting off on the wrong foot a lot of times. If mm -hmm. they take a few steps back and look at um, what some of these old buildings are doing, pre-air conditioning, um, pre-all that stuff, pre-solar panels, right. um, what, how do you solve problems with what you have? And, and also, how do you make it affordable? You know, people... People who are buying these units don't want to be paying a ton of money, but they still want to live in comfort. So, I mean, can you, can you again, design a building using these principles that uh, belongs in the tropics, that's affordable, and that's extremely comfortable and nice to live in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we're, you know, we've talked about this, that we're less interested in the fact that these are old buildings, but we're more interested in the fact that these are good designed buildings, well-designed buildings. Yeah, exactly. And, and we want to advocate for good design um, at the end of the day. Um, and so kind of, you know, to segue out of this, um, you know, a lot of these buildings at mid-century all kind of evoke these, these or follow these same principles um, that we're looking, re-looking at again today, you know, sustainability, passive ventilation, but also just something that looks really inviting and is, you know, talks about the regional character of Hawaii. And its architecture, um, and I have to make a quick plug for um, what all of these uh, uh, think tech shows hosted by Dokomomo um, are leading up to. So in September, at the end of September of this year, we're going to be hosting our uh, Dokomomo National Symposium. We're very excited about. Um, Brandon's actually going to be uh, hosting a walking tour of the Makiki area and showing off the Oahuan yeah. and some other buildings. Sign up. Yeah, sign up, definitely. Um, and sign up for the whole conference in general. It's going to be a, a great, um, great week to be, um, you know, uh, embracing the architecture of Hawaii. And, um, yeah, I want to thank everyone again for, for joining us for this show. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing you all in September. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you.